Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this session where we are going to be discussing possibly one of the most emotional, um, important areas of life for so many billions of people around the world, which is around the ideas of faith. My name is Kamal Ahmed. I'm the editor-in-chief and co-founder of The News Movement. We are a business all about communication and content creation for younger demographics across the world. And we may get on to younger demographics, Generation Z, 18 to 25, and their thoughts about faith and spirituality and different notions of what religion is. But really, we're here today to speak about the often essential role that faith and religion plays in the types of societies we live in. And at a time when there are such tensions between nations, at a time when there is such concern about the economy, everything overridden by concern about climate, what role does faith have, does religion have, in bringing together business, government, civil society, communities, in trying to find some solutions to some of those big problems that we face. We're going to be joined with this expert panel for the next 45 minutes for a fascinating discussion about the role of faith and keeping faith as an important part of the societies that we all live in and the communities we live with. So I have a wonderful group of people here to discuss some of these uh, vital issues. On my far left, Alexis Crow, who is partner, uh, global head, geopolitical investing at PwC. Welcome, Alexis. Uh, and then Farhan Latif, president of the El Hibri Foundation in the USA. Welcome, Farhan. Uh, Barry Dugal, uh, principal representative of the Baha'i International Community, United Nations office. Welcome. And Jonathan Greenblatt, CEO of the Anti-Defamation League in the USA. Great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining um, this session. We will be coming to this wonderful audience here for questions towards the last 15 minutes of this 45 minute session. And welcome everyone who is joining us watching the live stream of this event. Alexis, can I start with you? I think it'd be lovely for people just to hear from each of the panel, um, just your faith journey to an extent and how faith maybe affects the world you live in and what you do and your perspective on this big debate. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to be with this distinguished panel today. And um, I'm very humbled to uh, represent uh, the World Economic Forum uh, Young Global Leader Community here, uh, which is a leadership development program bringing people from all different cultures and continents together uh, to build a more inclusive and sustainable future. And for me, keeping faith is an essential foundation for the, that premise and for those huge goals and immense goals. Um, by my day to day, I work as a global economist and I help corporations and private pools of capital around the globe uh, to navigate the macroeconomic environment in which they make their decisions, uh, to navigate this very complex geopolitical landscape in which we all operate, uh, as well as, as to think about the long term and, as you mentioned, uh, key negative externalities such as climate. And from my purview, and I, I reside in the United States, we live in this age of hyper-polarization. And we're, we're seeing Secretary Yellen talk about the implications of this, you know, with, with the potential, you know, for the debt ceiling and, and issues in the United States, the economic spillovers of this. Uh, I also work regularly with foreign pools of capital who view the hyperpolarization in the United States as a significant risk for increasing their portfolio allocation to the United States. So what I'd like to focus on today is, is the specific spillovers of this polarization in the business and investing landscape. And in America, we have this distinction of woke versus MAGA. And I was speaking about this the other night, and, uh, and someone said, please elaborate. Uh, so for those who are not familiar with the terminology, woke is a pejorative term uh, to describe progressive elements of the left uh, and the community of the left in the United States, which is 
I would say, derived from the term awakened. Um, and MAGA uh, is, of course, the acronym for uh, former President Trump's campaign of making America great again. And there are these exchange traded funds which focus on GOP and MAGA investing. Um, there are express investment communities in the United States that will say we will do woke investing or we will do MAGA investing. So I have sovereign investors who are very concerned again about this landscape. And nowhere is this clearer than on the environment. Uh, and when we look at the entire lens of ESG, environmental social governance criteria for business, one can argue that the environmental piece is the furthest along in terms of codification and reporting. Uh, and still, businesses, boards, executives are concerned, and I hear this regularly, that by living up to goals to move toward 1.5 net zero futures, that this might erode the underlying economic value of their company. And so we stand in this environment today where whole companies and investors and individuals are getting held to task by state and municipal governments uh, for their policies and for taking a stand not only on the environment, but also on social issues. And what I see is particularly uh, a dynamic of this is that there is a huge chasm between the younger generations and a lot of these investors and executives. And we can use the environment example where younger generations, and we see this in the global risk report that WEF puts out, younger generations feel that executives have uh, blasted through global reserves be it debt or be it on the environment, and that's at the cost of the future growth for these generations. So we need to look at the precepts for moving forward for how companies and executives can address this in a way that reaches across generations, in a way that reaches across generational divides and political divides, and also in a way that reaches across cultures. Um, and we can get into that as well. So I had identified in my own journey um, some precepts that can be brought forward. And that is specifically relating to Catholic social teaching that emerges in the 19th century. Um, and this is Pope Leo XIII's Rerum Novarum Encyclical. And he looks at the questions of social justice that have been raised by Marxism and this juxtaposition versus of labor versus capital. And this asks new questions about the human relationship to work. And what comes out of this as well is developed with John Paul II in the age of globalization and looking at the questions of economic life and morality with different cultures around the world. And there are three concepts that for me emerge that can be brought forward by the business community. One is solidarity. And we saw this very clearly with the solidarity with essential workers during the COVID pandemic. The second is subsidiarity, that everyone, no matter what their education, no matter what their cultural background, has a role to play in economic life and, can, and should be sustained accordingly. The third is the dignity of work. And this is actually gets quite divisive with students at Columbia Business School when we talk about the dignity of work. <clears throat> And this is that every human being has the right to participate and the freedom to participate into economic life. So those are the three concepts and I'm happy to be able to break them down into practical suggestions as well. That's fantastic, Les. What, how interesting to immediately connect what to many would appear to be the totally rational world of investment with actually some of uh, the principles of faith-based thinking. So great start, thank you so much. Um, Alexis. Farhan, tell us a little bit about your story. We had a fabulous coffee. We were able to get together before this, um, before this uh, panel session. And you just told a remarkable story about your journey into realising the importance of faith for community resilience, for example. Just, just give us a flavour of the journey you've been on. Sure. Thank you, Kamal. Uh, I really appreciated that. Uh, and, you know, before I jump in, I I wanted to offer a trigger warning to people in the audience as I was preparing for this session and I told them I'm coming here. They told me don't use the words religion, faith and God. And, um, you know, and so I just asked people to translate that to mindfulness, purpose driven, <laughs> spirituality. Um, but joking aside, I'm honored to be here and uh, really grateful to the World Economic Forum for hosting this important conversation. You know, I was privileged to grow up 
as a child of two loving parents who, uh, because of their work, constantly had to travel from city to city, from country to country growing up. And I had the chance to live uh, most of my life growing up in either a context of living uh, in Muslim majority communities and places like Dubai and Doha and um, Karachi, but also then living as a minority as a Muslim. And ultimately, when it came to time for college, I moved to Washington, D.C., or moved to the U.S. And, you know, during that time when I was in college, I remember one day sitting in the library and seeing a group of people, a group of students, praying in the corner uh, behind the books and offering their sunset prayer. And a security guard comes in and escorts them all out of the library at that time. And at that time, I, with the advice of the administration, went ahead and formulated and started a club on campus. And it was called the Muslim Student Association. And that was the way to help these students have a place to pray. And the first day that I was the president of the MSA was 9-11. So I was in grief and in horror watching and mourning the lives of the 3,000 or so innocent lives that were lost. Um, but I had no idea the backlash that was just put into motion. The next day, a professor comes onto campus and pushes a Muslim student down the steps and flushes a copy of the Quran down the toilet. My aunt is walking to uh, Joanne Fabrics to her job, and a guy pulls over and says, go back to where you came from, and spat on her. And you know, this was her realizing her American dream. And uh, I remember uh, you know, the first man that was shot in the country was a man wearing a turban. He was sick. He was not even Muslim. Uh, and so there was this tremendous uptick in hate crimes during that time. Mosques were being burnt, um, you know, people being attacked. And um, I, too, at that time, uh, remember walking out of my apartment and uh, getting attacked, beaten down and they tried to run a car over me. So it was extremely, extremely painful time, and the implications were felt even stronger for other communities. Uh, when I look at uh, black communities, black Muslim communities, I mean, they were facing uh, you know, becoming a triple minority, dealing with Islamophobia and racism. So however, during this time, I also faced and experienced the greatest form of allyship as well, specifically from Jewish and Christian communities and sometimes people of no faith who stepped up and you know, provided uh, uh, solidarity, uh, allyship, and uh, used their power, privilege, and platform to stand by our communities. So I think it's that journey that 20 years later now, I find myself at a philanthropy called the al Hibri Foundation. It was started by um, a Muslim man uh, and his, uh, from Lebanese background, and his wife uh, from a German Catholic background. And they both had lived through uh, the war in Lebanon and also had been protectors of Jewish communities through the Holocaust. And that's the work that inspires what we do today. So our work is um, investing in leaders, cross-sector leaders, and institutions uh, that are working for uh, advancing inclusion, uh, working across difference. And we do so by uh, investing in religious literacy, capacity building, and our work is grounded in contact theory with the hope to inspire a generation of leaders who can work across difference to improve society. Farhan, thank you so much. Thank you for your honesty as well in um, some of the pain that you, you personally experienced, but also many communities experienced after those awful events. Um, of 9-11, so we're very grateful uh, for that. Uh, Barney, can I come to you? Um, tell us uh, your journey. Now, the Baha'i faith will maybe not be as well known as, as some uh, faiths, so I, I would love to hear a little bit about those approaches, but as well as hearing a lot about your journey and this notion of how faith has maybe helped us consider different ways of supporting communities and society in general. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to both of you for your sharing and sharing <clears throat> your personal journeys. Um, I was born in New Delhi, and I was raised in a Sikh family. Mm. Um, we were a practicing Sikh family. I learned the faith at the knee of my grandmother and my mother. And um, my parents uh, lived in Delhi. They had friends from all over the country of every religion. And, uh, and my father worked for a British um, firm. So the, he traveled a lot, and he had, they had friends from every country <laughs> in the world, practically, that, who would visit India and visit our home. So I grew up with a sense of um, understanding of diversity and the beauty of it. And, uh, embraced it quite early on. Um, I went to boarding school where, again, there were um, you know, students from all, all uh, faiths and traditions. And our morning assembly, we prayed uh, in all religious, uh, all religious prayers. And then as an adult, of course, you get on with your life. I became a lawyer. I was practicing at the Supreme Court. I had two young children. And then Mrs. Gandhi was assassinated. So it's funny how there are various political moments in life that you know become that defining moment for one. And she was killed by two uh, Sikh um, bodyguards um, because in the wake of the desecration of the Golden Temple by the Indian Army, etc. I'm not going to go into a history lesson here, but it became a time when. Sikhs became, uh, and, and her assassination was followed by riots. And S Sikhs were butchered in New Delhi, which was the capital city of the country. And we had never, ever conceived of something like that happening. And um, the Sikhs, including my in-laws, became very uh, concerned and started talking about moving to Punjab, where we'll be safe. And, and of course, I've shared my background, and I couldn't even conceive of going off and living you know, in a little commune somewhere. So <clears throat> anyhow, in the meantime, I'd had two sons. And they both had little top knots, so the baby just had a little ponytail mm -hmm. sticking up there. And we moved to the US. <clears throat> my husband at the time wanted to do his LLM, and I did mine as well uh, soon after. But the question of religion was very much present in my life now because I felt the responsibility towards my sons. And I wanted to raise them in faith. And much as I loved Sikhism and everything it stood for, I was torn by the whole identity issue, etc., and the inward-looking uh, uh, nature of the community at that time. It's not today, uh, I'm glad to say. But And then I had learned of the Baha'i faith, had been reading about it, and it just struck me as everything I believed in. The core beliefs of the Baha'is uh, Baha are the oneness of humanity, the unity and diversity, that all people come from the same source, all religions emanate from the same source. and. Uh, Baha'i houses of worship are open to everyone, and everybody comes, and you're welcome to um, read whatever writings from whichev whichever religion you wish to. And, and that's how we pray together with others. So that was the most natural sort of um, religious expression for me, and I embraced it. And, uh, and then, of course, I told you, I, I did my LLM in environmental law. And while I loved studying it, I didn't like the practice. It was very regulatory and in some ways unfair. And that's a discussion for another time. So I ended up coming to the Baha'i International Community's UN office in New York uh, to volunteer for a short while before I figured out what I wanted to do. And that was in 1994. <laughs> I am still there, and I absolutely love my work. Um, gender equality is a very important uh, principle for Baha'is, and so I did a lot of work in that area. It was a passion of mine even before I became a Baha'i. And then, of course, we have uh, uh, you know, faith communities around the world are engaging in um, 
along with their collaborators in conversations about what's important for humanity today. And that is what we do. And you know, sometimes I'm guilty being paid for what I'm doing because this, these are all uh, things that I hold dear to my heart and apparently to the microphone too, but sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so that's what uh, we do at the UN office and I look forward to talking more. Mm. I don't want to take up too much yeah. time. It's wonderful to hear how those personal connections, often, sometimes you say, with very uh, violent historic moments, become part of people's journey on, in faith and makes them consider where faith lives in their lives. It's been interesting how emotional this has felt, this discussion, which I think is, is part of why faith has this such a powerful uh, role. Uh, Jonathan, Take us through. It wouldn't immediately appear uh, obvious, maybe, to many people why the Anti-Defamation League would be something where faith can play a big role. Before maybe getting onto that bit, just your journey and maybe reflections a bit on the, some of the emotion that we've already heard on this panel. Yeah, I mean, it's what a privilege it is to be here at, uh, in Davos and, and humbling to have the opportunity to share the stage with such an esteemed group. And like, I'm moved by everything that I've heard. Um, my journey, um, well, so I grew up in a traditional Jewish home, um, but Judaism was something we did on Friday night, we kept Shabbat. Judaism is something that I do, uh, I, I maintain a kosher diet. Judaism is something that I do privately. And then for me, I'd spent most of my career in business. I had been brought into the White House by President Obama, where I ran the innovation office in the West Wing. And the plan was, with my wife and kids, to go back to California and to go do something in business, like to raise a fund after my public service. And um, I got a call from the headhunter about this job at the ADL, which seemed like a very interesting call, certainly out of, as we say, left field. I mean, ADL is the oldest anti-hate organization in the US. It was founded 110 years ago to fight anti-Semitism. That's the mission. It says it in the charter they wrote in 1913. Um, it uses the law and advocacy to, and it has, you know, again, for over a century to fight for Jews and other communities. The founding ethos of the organization, I mean, the words in the mission are, quote, its purpose is to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment to all. So what's so interesting is when it was founded 110 years ago, Jews in America didn't have significant cultural capital or social standing. They were a weak and vulnerable community. There was systemic discrimination in America against Jews in lots of areas, education, healthcare, you know, occupations, et cetera. And yet these, and the, the catalyzing event that created ADL was the lynching of this Jewish man who was falsely accused of a crime, wrongly convicted, and hung from a tree outside of Atlanta. And while the body was still hanging from the rope, the town gathered around and they held a picnic underneath the corpse. They took photographs, turned the, took pictures, turned the photographs into souvenirs and gave them out. You can still find them in parts of the South. So ADL was founded in this moment of severe stress against the Jewish community. But what's so interesting, at a time when we talk about intersectionality and social justice, these Jews said, we will fight for ourselves and we will fight for others. Again, we take those words for granted today. Everybody believes that our struggles are interconnected. But 110 years ago, that was an audacious, outrageous idea. And one could theoretically say, you can't even take care of yourselves. Mm -hmm. But there's a Jewish ethos, and it's kind of exemplified by the words of Hillel, this famous sage, mm -hmm. who said, if I'm not for myself, who will be? But if I'm only for myself, what am I? So it is not a, the, the founding idea of ADL, the, this core principle of Judaism, is this notion that Jews can only be safe if everyone is safe. And only when everyone has justice can the Jewish people have justice. And I, and I say, that, I mean, you could, you know, you could, if you will, sum up the whole Talmud, you know, as do unto others, as you would have them do unto you. So all of this is to say, 
when I got a call about this job, I thought, I'm not a lawyer. I've never worked a nonprofit. And Jewish was something that I did on Saturdays. But uh, I called my rabbi, a guy by the name of David Wolpe, who runs a, is, ministers a very large congregation in Los Angeles. I said, Rabbi Wolpe, what do I do? <laughs> I don't think I'm qualified for this. And Rabbi Wolpe said, it's a call to service. And he said in so many words, you know, the Lord works in mysterious ways. And so I took the job not really knowing how this would go. And, you know, to answer your question, ultimately, Kamal, like, I feel really blessed. I mean, the work is hard, fighting hate every day against Jews, against Muslims, against Baha'i, against, you know, different Christian sects, Hindus, the Asian American community, the LGBTQ community. It is hard, hard stuff. And yet, and yet, I, I think about what Alexis said. You will never have safety unless you have security and solidarity. And I think while it's exhausting work, it's energizing, and it renews my faith on a daily basis. It's fantastic, Jonathan. A, again, thank you for sharing that. And B, again, that touch which you, Farhan and Barney, you've both brought out, that out of stress has come something amazing. Yeah. Uh, that lynching story I've not heard before, and it's astonishingly uh, powerful. We want this session to be about concrete examples of what can be done. <clears throat> in that fight every day, as you say, Jonathan, against hate polluting the societies that we uh, live in. Joined by a, you're all based in the US, so this will be uh, uh, somewhat geographically specific sometimes, but we may go on to other points. But Alexis, give us some concrete examples that the audience, the people watching on the live stream can take away and maybe be able to take into their communities, their neighborhoods, their countries, their businesses, to help them consider how faith can support what we all hope is a journey towards a better society. Thank you, Kamal. So um, I, as we're sitting in uh, the privileged landscape of the Swiss Alps uh, with business leaders, I had focused on three tangible examples for business leaders across sectors, across geographies. Um, and so the first one on solidarity, it's interesting, you know, we're, we're joined here by the chairman, Klaus Schwab, who's written so much on the stakeholder concept. And this is really embedded in German corporate behavior, um, where you're really looking to the employee for co-ownership of a company, uh, where you're really looking to bring in an employee into the governance structure of a company, uh, which standing in America, where I've been in the corporate landscape, that's rare. Uh, you know, big tech has done that, but I think we really have a long way to go. Milton Friedman and the shareholder concept still rears its ugly head. And so that needs to be addressed um, as well. So just thinking about forms of co-ownership and governance. The second on subsidiarity, uh, I've been laughing uh, with, with a friend in the audience today that uh, climate is very much a dominant theme here, uh, uh, over, overly dominating theme. But what's interesting about that is one industry body has actually looked at, okay, the majority of climate financing that's raised in the spiritual home of climate, which is Europe, remains in Europe. And if we're going to look to other countries who need to get along and ahead in the energy transition, I'm thinking about huge carbon emitters like India, uh, looking across pockets of developing Asia, there has to be a de-risking and an engagement with these communities. So I think large pools of capital will have to think about how we are bringing other cultures along in this. I can't just stay in Europe where I know, you know the assets will be profitable. I, I may have to take on more risk and go to other cultures. So that's one on subsidiarity. Um, the second uh, on uh, it connected to that on subsidiarity and, and connected to the dignity of work um, is on education. And historically, education has been conceived of, particularly in the US, as a public outlay. That is, this is not for the private sector to invest in. Uh, it's something you know, that gets a lot of people indebted and governments indebted. Um, but increasingly, what we're seeing in a positive development in the emergence from the pandemic is companies and investors actually taking on the responsibility to upskill their workforces themselves, to offer apprenticeship programs themselves in this very tight labor market that we've been operating in to be able to offer college education 
uh, to their workers to keep them on staff, uh, to be able to help provide management skilling for those that haven't had the, the grace of being able to go to a business school. And so more and more, I actually think that investment in human capital will be the next part of the ESG landscape and the social criteria specifically that companies and investors will have to focus on. And by that, everyone wins. I'm reminded of um, the late Steve Jobs uh, when he pushed his deputy Wozniak and he said, you know, we, 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 we can't keep investing in upskilling our people because then they're just going to leave. And Wozniak looks at Jobs and says, well, what if we don't? Absolutely. Barney, tell us a little about some practical um, examples. Given such a great length of time, you've had this amazingly enjoyable job, as you've told us, um, uh, where if it's business, if it's communities, if it's non-governmental organizations, uh, government, where you've seen some real concrete examples of positive change. Yeah, so I, <clears throat> I believe uh, faith communities everywhere in the world, we may live in the US, I certainly do, and I represent the Baha'i international community to the UN, but we have communities all over the world in every country even if they are in small numbers, and they are working together with others to uh, build strong communities. And they do this by having conversations about what's important and what's necessary for the community. And out of that, organically, we have uh, numerous programs that uh, emerge that um, are meant to strengthen the economic life, the spiritual life, uh, the lives of the children of the communities where they live. And I'll give you some concrete examples. In uh, Mwilunga, Zambia, apologies to the residents of that town, um, if I mispronounce the name, um, there, were, there were these um, programs for junior youth, um, between the ages of 10 and 16, uh, to talk about the well-being of their community, etc. And these young um, children had been walking around and noticed that some of the ponds in their village had, because of uh, climate uh, change, um, the biodiversity of these ponds had um, uh, degraded. and. Uh, they came to the adults and had a conversation and uh, started a program on uh, building a healthier uh, biodiversity in the ponds and, and uh, thinking about sustainable fishing because there had been overfishing in some of these areas which had resulted in this problem. And now that um, region has a thriving uh, fishing but also a sustainable way of working and it very much came out of that uh, you know faith lens because they wanted to give back to their community during covid in countries like kazakhstan and kurdistan um, there were online conversations taking place about how to um, maintain thriving communities and uh, they found uh, government officials, civil society actors, co-religionists, uh, members of other religions were joining these conversations to uh, think about ways to sustain uh, the life, the community life uh, in their societies. Um, we have the, it used to be known as the European Baha'i Business Forum, but now it's um, European Business for ethical something, I'm an ethical business forum, sorry. Um, and they are engaging with um, business leaders uh, to have conversations about ethical business practices. So there are many, I mean, I could go into uh, several business projects, et cetera, that have emerged from um, the conversations that we are having within the community uh, along with others. Fantastic to see some um, examples there. Jonathan, just a couple of examples that maybe you're proudest of in terms of, as you say, it's energizing, but it's tough fighting hate. So anti-Asian hate crimes are up reportedly 164% last year. 
164%. We saw in 2021 a mass casualty event where six Asian American, or, or six Asian American women were killed in Atlanta. I'm proud of the fact that ADL incubated an organization to protect the Asian American Pacific Islander community. Over the course of 18 months, we hired, trained, provided back office, and then helped roll out something called the Asian American Foundation. You can see it online at taaf.org. And we raised over a billion dollars, over $1.1 billion for AAPI causes. I'm proud of that. I'm proud of in 2017 when anti-xenophobic, hateful, anti-immigrant, anti-Latino crimes were way up in harassment. Um, we worked with the government of Mexico and provided training to over 2,000 Mexican and like South American, which is the Central South American diplomatic officials on hate crimes and extremism. We developed training in Spanish for them so that when Mexican nationals, the Salvadoran nationals who were afraid to go to the police to report ant harassment against them and their children and their parents, they would go to the consulates. The consulates knew how to support them because ADL offices provided hundreds of training that reached thousands of people. And I'm particularly proud of the fact that, you know, anti-Semitism in America is going in the wrong direction. We just released data last week. It reached the highest point we've seen in 30 years. From 11% of the population in 2019 expressing strongly held anti-Semitic views to 20%, almost double, three years. Anti-Semitic incidents, acts of harassment, vandalism, and violence, We've been tracking it for 45 years. It reached an all-time high in 2021. I think the 2022 data, which we haven't finalized yet, will be worse. And yet, we are now working more closely, not only with synagogues, schools, JCCs, et cetera, to make sure that our community is prepared and able to defend itself. We're also now working with black churches, HBCUs, Asian American houses of worship and community centers, Hindu temples, Sikh Gurdwaras, to provide support for them through a new coalition we created. And ultimately, you know, look, for all the protective work that we do, we work with law enforcement, we train. One of the highlights of my career at ADL was last year, you, uh, it's like a year ago almost to the day, to the January 15th, there was the hostage crisis in Colleyville, Texas, where a radicalized an individual subscribed to kind of been radicalized online by ISIS, or excuse me, Al-Qaeda, went from the UK to Texas and took a rabbi and three people hostage. It was a horrible incident. After an 11-hour standoff, they were all freed. And in his first interview on Monday morning, the rabbi said, before I take your question to Gail King, he said, I want to thank FBI, local law enforcement, and ADL for the training that saved our lives. That was a highlight. And that guy, Rabbi Charlie, now works for ADL. So while the issues are serious and severe, the solidarity that I'm seeing within the Jewish community and from others is really encouraging. What we can, if we can replicate what we do for the Jewish community, for the Latino community, for the a Asian American community, Dainu. Lots of things you can do together, isn't there? And that's some powerful storytelling there. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, Farhan, give us uh, some of the examples that you've been working with through uh, the work you do. Sure. I really appreciate what our panelists have shared and the stories. And, um, you know, the first story is, of course, COVID. But I feel like you uh, covered a bit of it to demonstrate how faith communities used um, their social capital uh, for social cohesion. Um, but, you know, we'll get into that maybe if we have some time in the Q&A. The one story that I do want to share specifically on this uh, is uh, about a tri-sector collaboration uh, that, um, you know, as a funder, you get to see some of the bright spots of collaborations happening across the, the nation. And in one specific example, after the 2016 elections, you could see an uptick in hate crimes uh, election season is really the time when polarization and fragmenta fragmentation is at its peak. And, and I'm really, again, concerned about next year uh, or 2024 as we you know, look, look ahead. 
But during this time when um, Islamophobia uh, and cases were high, anti-Semitism was rising, the rise of white supremacy and neo-Nazi movements, um, two business leaders came forward, um, one Jewish, one Muslim, and uh, were running, uh, corporate leaders were running well-trusted brands, Henry Schein and Ethan Allen. And so these two uh, corporate leaders um, stepped up, uh, Stanley Bergman, who's in the room here today, and Farooq Kathwari, and they came together and brought together a diverse uh, cross-section of leaders to form an advisory group called the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council. And they brought um, you know, their corporate background housed in a, a civil society institution um, to really think about you know, how to address uh, you know, what is going on. And it was bringing two unlikely partners that, yes, Everyone recognizes at times may have differing views and perspectives on international affairs, um, but have a lot to do in terms of shared purpose and interest on a domestic level. And this partnership is incredible because it led to um, a legislative action um, by, by passing bipartisan legislation uh, you know, that focused on protecting religious minorities, houses of worship, uh, and looking at hate crimes. And they ensured that hate crimes were being reported and acted upon. And you know, essentially when this happens, you're making sure that if somebody goes and attacks somebody because of the way they look or pray or burn down a place of worship, that it will not be a minor offense, that action will be taken and addressed. And in doing so, you're not just protecting religious minorities, you're protecting everybody. Um, this is also interesting because it was an action that backed by business leaders also had bipartisan support. So Democrats and Republicans came together to do this. Um, it's a concrete example of how CEOs, and I think it's so relevant to have this conversation here at Davos, where CEOs can step up and really prevent a society from going off the cliff and maintaining social fabric. It's also an example where CEOs can stand up, uh, publicly identify with their faith background. And that in itself signals greater inclusion and belonging uh, within business and society. And finally, you know, I think it demonstrates how business and faith communities can converge on shared values. Um, standing up for civil rights, human rights, um, dignity of people, and religious freedom. Farhan, thank you so much. I'm very aware of the time, and I have to apologize for everyone that we're not going to have time for a Q&A, so I'm just so sorry about that. That's my fault as timekeeper. Uh, the panel will be here, sadly not for those on the streaming service, but the panel will be here for a few minutes afterwards, so please do continue uh, the conversation. In the last 90 seconds that we do have together, though, I'd just like to come to each of the panel with their eye on the clock at the back of the room there, if you could. Um, just a couple of words to maintain the optimist, optimistic flavour that the four of you have um, uh, constructed so powerfully out of the stress points for many of these journeys in faith that we have spoken about on this panel. But Alexis, could I come to you for just two or three powerful words that can help us leave this panel with a sense of optimism? Thank you. I, I think about uh, the human person, which is increasingly under threat from machines and AI and development. And what I would say is I'm actually quite buoyant, not only from this panel, but also the emergence from the pandemic, that the human person and the subject and the dignity of the human person can be carried forward in this age of automation, in this age of negative externalities, um, that there is solidarity amongst faith and communities and business leaders to be able to address these challenges. I'm, I'm actually quite hopeful. Great. Farhan, two words. Go. <laughs> Time's up. Um, I'm, I think the, the, the panel, uh, the subject of the panel was keeping faith. And I think it's this idea of having optimism and hope 
Um, and um, if I could just add, the report that the World Economic Forum has written on the role of faith communities is really worth looking at. So. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Time is against us. I'm so sorry. I saw you nodding in agreement, and I'm sure <laughs> some powerful words would have come through. My super powerful uh, panel, thank you so much for such a thoughtful, emotional, and optimistic conversation. Thank you, audience, and thank you, everyone, for watching.